Okay, everyone, let's get started. So today is going to be a bit of a step away from what we've been doing. And uh, I talk a lot about the Ice Age world and uh, what the world was like in the last Ice Age. And we all have, a, I think, a slightly funny idea of what that was actually like, partly imparted by movies such as this. Um, but also, the world was very different. And in terms of geologic time, 20,000 years ago, it was vastly different on a very small time scale. I know that 20,000 years to you guys sounds like an awful lot, but to me as a geologist, it doesn't sound like a lot. Um, and so it's really interesting to look back. And I love studying past climate and the Earth in this way, because I think it's the nearest we get to exploring sort of other planets just by looking in the past at what ours was like. So today we're going to look at what our Ice Age world was like, in particular 20,000 years ago. We're going to look again at what sort of results in that lovely pattern of ice ages that we see. Um, and then we're also going to take a look at a little snapshot of a more recent time scale when we had a little more ice on our planet, which is the Little Ice Age, which was really just in uh, the last sort of thousand years or so. So it should be a really interesting uh, way of looking at the impact that ice has had on humans and human civilization as well. So first of all, because there were very, well, not very few of you, but relatively few people are here on Friday. And I would like to see if we can get to this idea. So if the amount of ice on Earth increases, what will happen to the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 in the ocean? So think about where the oxygen 16 will go and what will that do to the amount of oxygen 18 compared to the oxygen 16 in ocean water. Okay, so think about it for a couple of minutes carefully first. So has everyone had a chance to vote who would like to vote? Yep, okay, let's take a look then and see how we're doing with this. Okay. Water containing which isotope would evaporate more easily, the heavier one or the lighter one? The lighter one. And where will that light isotope water therefore go? up towards the poles, and it will build up as ice. And that ice will have lots of 16. So what will happen to the amount of oxygen 18 compared to 16 in the ocean? So if we're taking out all of the oxygen 16, not all of it, but if we're taking out more of the oxygen 16, and we're leaving behind more of the oxygen 18, then that ratio of 18 to 16 will actually increase. Okay. So if you didn't quite get that one, I would recommend going to um, your discussion group this week. Um, because instead of looking at oxygen isotopes, we're going to do the same thing uh, with what we call deuterium, which is just the heavy version of hydrogen. And so it's really going to give you a chance to think through these steps um, and do this sort of question. So if you're struggling with this, I do encourage you to go to discussion this week, and your TAs will be able to help you out. Okay. So this is what my, my image showed, do you remember? The fact that because oxygen 16 is lighter, the water containing that will evaporate from the ocean more easily. It forms our clouds. As those clouds move towards the pole, what we find is that the, the water, can, it, whatever water up there that does contain oxygen 18, will tend to condense out more easily. And so as that cloud sort of has rainfall coming out of it and continues moving towards the pole, we get lighter and lighter and lighter until by the time we get up to the pole, the snow coming from those clouds has hardly any oxygen 18 in it compared to the, the oxygen 16. Okay. Um, and we call that really a, a negative delta O18 because we always compare that to ocean water and it's going to have a, a negative signal compared to water. Okay? And do you remember that I also said that the nice thing about this is that ice core records are absolutely fantastic. They're some of the most exciting things to come out of our field. Um, but there is only sort of so old ice on Antarctica. We can go back 800,000 years, which is spectacular, but we can't go back any further than that. The really nice thing is, is that we can go further back than that in the ocean because what we, we record is instead of recording that signal in the ice at the poles, we're recording what's left behind in the ocean water. So what we find is that when we have more ice <coughs> at the poles, we see heavier water, okay? The oceans have more oxygen 18 in them. 
And then when we have less ice, the oceans again, uh, the, the oceans again have more oxygen, 16. Okay? And what we can do is we can look at the shells of things that precipitate uh, from seawater. So for example, calcium carbonate has lots of lovely oxygen in it. And so we can measure the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 in these shells, and we can work out roughly how much ice there must have been on Earth um, for a very long time. Here, in fact, is that. So on the left there, you can see uh, what we call foraminifera, which is a very fancy name. Um, but really, they're just single-celled organisms um, that either float around in the surface ocean, that lower panel shows those, or that live at the bottom of the sea floor. And they precipitate their calcium carbonate shells from seawater, and so they record this nice oxygen isotope ratio for us. And so my top graph there shows um, the uh, time scale is from sort of minus, oh, 65 million years ago up to today on the right-hand side. And you can see that our, ox our oxygen isotopes in seawater have gradually been getting heavier. Does that mean we're getting more ice or less ice? More, OK? As more of that oxygen-16 is being locked up at the pole. So you can see that actually over that whole sort of time, we have been gradually cooling down. If we look at just the last sort of four or five million years in the bottom panel here, you can start to see that, yes, we've been cooling down, but also we can see these wiggles. And these wiggles are those glacial, interglacial timescales. Okay? Those 100,000-year timescales uh, where we see warmer conditions and cooler conditions. Okay? So we can get a really neat record going back a very long way of what our climate has been doing in this way. So this is where we got to on Friday. We were looking at uh, the Antarctic ice core. Um, and in particular, we were looking at how the, the CO2 record matches up really nicely with temperature. It's not a simple relationship. What we see is actually that the temperature goes up slightly before CO2 at the end of an ice age. But then the CO2 kicks in, and that further increases our temperature. We also saw that it was much drier and dustier during our cold glacial phases. And that's because, do you remember we said that when it's cooler, we're going to have less evaporation. The climate, the atmosphere is going to be slightly drier. So we did have these sort of very different environments in our recent past. And then we said, well, look, these things seem to change on 100,000-year timescales. And I said, does that sound familiar? And someone, at least, over on that side said yes, because they remembered that we have our Milankovitch cycles. And you remember quite some time ago now, so I thought it was worth bringing back again, we talked about this is a one way that we can change our climate, the fact that our orbit around the sun isn't perfectly stable the whole time. It changes on these different timescales. So first of all, we have our eccentricity cycle. And that changes every 100,000 years from more circular to more elliptical. We have our obliquity cycle, which changes every 40,000 years or so. And this is the tilt of Earth's axis. And it can vary between sort of 24 and 21. OK. So check your awake. If you would like to grow your ice sheet, if you would like to grow an ice sheet, which of those two cases do you think you would like? Would you want the Earth to be tilted at 24.5 further over or 21.5? So think about it for a minute. Think about what is most important for maintaining and, and building up an ice sheet. And then you get to vote. So you can consult your neighbor and the TAs again for this one. So there's two parts to this question. What do you think is most important for building up an ice sheet? Cold summers, he remembers. Well done. Cold summers. So which of these will give us cold summers? Any more? Right, let's see how we did. It's been a while since we've thought about this. We did pretty well. Good work, guys. Yeah, absolutely. So our 21 and a half, does anyone want to be brave and tell me why? Noah wants to be brave and tell me why. Well, obviously, if, we, if we're going to have one person at the back, tell me why. Uh, it's got to do with the uh, beam depletion. 
Absolutely. Do you remember we had beam spreading and beam depletion? And so if our North Pole and our high latitudes are more tilted over, they're going to have less of that beam spreading because that light is going to be arriving a sort of more overhead. Absolutely. Well done. And so what we want if we want cold summers is we want there to be a relatively low angle. OK, great. And then, of course, we had precession, which is the one everyone hates. Um, and this is the 20,000-year uh, or so time scale. Um, and it's the position of the equinoxes. So do you remember we said that today our Earth is tilted, our northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, so in our summer, when we're actually furthest away on our elliptical orbit. And our northern hemisphere is pointed away, so it's our winter, when we're at our closest point. But in 11,000 years' time or so, we're actually going to be tilted the other way. Okay? And so that, again, would change the amount of incoming radiation. And so if we think about how those cycles all interact, they're going to affect the amount of incoming radiation at our high latitudes. And so they're going to affect whether we can build up or whether we're going to start melting our ice sheet. So this is what we can do. We can take one particular latitude because if we're talking about northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, then it is going to be dependent on which hemisphere you're in and what latitude you're at. We can take any one particular latitude and we can plot the amount of incoming solar radiation that we would get for any particular month. Okay? So this is a, an example of an insulation curve and we have one at 65 degrees north for the last sort of 180,000 years. So today is at zero. 180,000 years is at my side. <coughs> okay, And we also have one that there is at, at 78 degrees south. Okay, And there's a reason why I've chosen those. Because I would like you to take a look at the temperature record from the Vostok ice core, which is at about 78 degrees south or so. It's, remember, it's on Antarctica. And I want you to compare that temperature record with the amount of incoming solar radiation at 65 degrees north and at 78 degrees south. And I want you to tell me which of those curves does the Antarctic ice core seem to be responding to. So compare those graphs. Look at the peaks and the, the troughs. Which latitude does our Antarctic ice core seem to follow more closely? It's going to be a bit difficult for people at the very sides, but it roughly lines up. I think that's more or less everybody. So if you haven't voted, do vote. And let's take a look. <sighs> Not going to take that. Look again. Talk to the people around you. For the people at the side, sort of peer in a bit. In particular, look at the peaks. When do the peaks line up? OK, so let's take a look, see what people put. It helped a little bit. So yes, if you look carefully, it's actually our, our sort of southern Antarctic ice cores seem to be responding most to the northern hemisphere incoming solar radiation. It's a bit weird, isn't it? So why? Does anyone have any ideas about why it might be responding to the northern hemisphere rather than the southern hemisphere? It's a really tough question. Where is most of the extra ice during our ice ages? In the northern hemisphere, why? Think back to sea ice. What did we say the difference was between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere? People are almost there. I can hear them working towards it. What is Antarctica surrounded by? Ocean. Ocean, thank you. <laughs> it's all right. I know you're on the right track. Antarctica is surrounded by ocean. And so there isn't really a lot of extra land to build up ice on. But in the northern hemisphere, if we think we have that Arctic Ocean, and then all around we have lots of lovely land that we can build up ice sheets on. And so if we look at our Ice Age world, that's where most of the extra ice is. And so if we're going to have our sort of cyclical ice ages, then really the northern hemisphere is where all of the action is happening. Does that make sense now? So if we're thinking about things like ice albedo, stuff like that, then it's going to, to make a biggest difference uh, what the northern hemisphere uh, solar insulation is doing. Okay? 
So this is what our world looks like, and we're going to come back to that in a second. But do you remember when we talked about this, I said that Milankovitch cycles were great for explaining the timing of these things. So you can see how the peaks lined up. But there was still quite a bit of difference in terms of the amplitude, in terms of the size of the change uh, that we see as a response of that incoming solar radiation change. Um, so what we need is instead we need feedbacks to kick in. So thinking back to the end of the last ice age, think about what is happening at the end of the ice age. Can you think of any positive feedback processes that will be happening that would help us sort of melt away further ice, that sort of would help us sort of move into a warmer world once we start warming up a little bit? You're all so quiet today. It's the quietest time in the class is when I ask a question. So you, you know lots and lots of positive feedbacks. I know you do. So tell me one. The, the question is, an honest answer. The question is, at the end of the last ice age, we saw a little bit of warming due to that uh, Milankovitch cycles. But we need to see actually a lot of warming to get into the full interglacial conditions. So we have to have positive feedback processes going on. So what positive feedback processes might be happening? Yes. Absolutely. If we're starting to melt back some of our ice sheets, some of our snow cover, then do you remember we have our positive feedback loop kicking in, which says that we're then going to reflect back less sunlight. And so we're going to have uh, a positive feedback loop where our temperatures keep going. Is OK? Sounding familiar? It should do. What other ones might be kicking in? What else might be uh, warming up apart from the ice sheets disappearing? What else might be warming up at the end of the last ice age? Permafrost. permafrost. And what does permafrost release? Methane. Methane and carbon dioxide. And this was a, a, a question that was uh, a little bit tricky, it seems, for a lot of people in um, the exam. So when you put food in your freezer, when you come back to it, is it still OK? Yes, why? Because it's too cold for it to decay. So a lot of people seem to think that the permafrost was trapping CO2 in some way. It's not. It's trapping organic matter, bits of plant, bits of animals. Okay? And they're not decaying just like the food in your freezer doesn't decay because it's too cold for those bacteria to work on it. Okay? So that was a commonly wrong one. But you are right that... Uh, if we're thawing out lots of permafrost at the end of the last ice age and releasing extra methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by that decay process, then we are going to see again a warming of our climate. Anyone think of any others? The others are slightly more tricky. <coughs> so other ones perhaps might include that the ocean would be warming. And as the ocean warms, it can't contain as much carbon dioxide. And so some of that carbon dioxide gets released into our atmosphere. The other one is, is that we had this amazing sort of cap of sea ice. We saw how extensive that sea ice was. And that prevents a lot of exchange um, of CO2 from the ocean to the atmosphere. And so by removing that cap, it's like taking the top off a soda bottle. All of that CO2 could bubble up and into the atmosphere again. So we have lots of feedback processes that, once we get that little bit of warming from these Milankovitch cycles, can really take over and launch us all the way from a really very cold ice age world into a full interglacial warmer period. Okay? So this is what our world looked like 20,000 years or so at the height of the last ice age. So what changes you can see? So we can see the ice sheets were sort of occupying a large part of the Northern Hemisphere, especially North America. We had two. We had a larger Greenland ice sheet. We had a Scandinavian ice sheet over Europe. We had much more extensive ice in the Himalayas and Siberia. We also had more along the Andes. But Antarctica is surrounded by ocean. We couldn't really extend out that far from Antarctica. But what we could do is also build up our sea ice. You can see how far the sea ice extent moved uh, most of, sort of northern Europe there would be surrounded by sea ice for much of the year, according to this. What else do you notice? Say if you look around Indonesia. <coughs> so 
There is more land. Why? <laughs> Because there's lower sea level. Because where is all the water? In the ice. It's in the ice, absolutely. We can't manufacture extra water on Earth to build up our ice. That water has to come from somewhere. It comes from the oceans. So you can see that all around the coastline, especially if you look at Florida, for example, um, and around Indonesia and parts of Northern Europe, there's a lot of extra land out there. And that's going to be important for, some, for when we talk about something a little later on. We also had very different vegetation patterns at that time. So most of the Earth was much drier, so our desert areas really expanded. Our tropical rainforests shrunk quite a lot. Over here in California, we were quite unusual and we got a little bit wetter, as you can see in a second. Um, but generally, sort of grassland tended to expand, and so we had very different vegetation patterns. We also just had much greater permafrost extent further south than we would do today, which makes a good deal of sense given that it was colder. And this is what California would have looked like at this time. You can see that we had much more ice and snow up in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, one of the quiz questions this week showed you uh, one of the, the tracks where glaciers used to come out. We also were much wetter. We had a huge network of lakes that often today are either dwindling or just completely dried up. You can also see that we had a lot more or a lower uh, sort of sea level, so our coastline was lower. And also, if you look, the Channel Islands, the Channel Islands National Park, were either attached to the mainland or at least were all joined together, okay? which was nice because it allowed them extra space and we got pygmy mammoths out on the, the Channel Islands, which is very cool. So, Ice Age animals. Would anyone like to identify an Ice Age animal for me? The mammoth. Give me another one. Now, what's the other one? A sloth. Absolutely. I wasn't sure you were going to get that one. It's a ground sloth. Okay. How do we know so much here, particularly, about our Ice Age animals? Which nearby location might give you a clue about our Ice Age animals? I think I heard over there, the tar pits. Who's been to the tar pits? A few people. What are the other guys doing? You don't go to the mountains, you don't go to the tar pits. They're fun places to go. You can go and have a look at a lot of the skeletons. A lot of our knowledge about Ice Age creatures, especially in this location in North America in general, comes from the tar pits, which are no distance at all from here. So you should all go over spring break. Okay. So let's have a look. So here are our ground sloths, and they were big. They were really big. They, sort of, some of these could have been twice my height, at least. They weighed about 1,000 kilograms, so a ton. So basically a small car, not a, a small American car, but a small European car, at least. Okay? Um, and you can see that I've stolen a lot of these images from the tar pits. They have wonderful information there. So if you want to find out more, you can do. Um, so these were wandering around. Um, at least sort of uh, nearly 20,000 years ago. We also had our mammoths and our mastodons. Um, and so you can see for a size comparison, our mastodons were maybe a little smaller than African elephants today, but our mammoths were quite a lot bigger. Does anyone know when the last lot of mammoths probably died out? Probably maybe 1,000 to 2,000 BC. Relatively recently, actually. So, um, but they were sort of tiny, isolated pockets, perhaps, up in Alaska. Um, but there were these sort of wonderful woolly mammoths roaming around. We also had other herbivores, things like bison, pronghorn. We did even have camels here as well, as horses um, and others. And then we have our somewhat more terrifying uh, carnivores. So this is a short-faced fa bear. And uh, the diagram above shows you a grizzly bear at the front, a polar bear in the middle, and then this guy at the back. This guy was also really big, really big, terrifyingly so. Um, and he probably could have sort of moved pretty fast um, at sort of certain times. We also had direwolves. Everyone thinks that they're something that Game of Thrones made up. They did actually exist, and we have examples of them uh, from the tar pits. And they're just like sort of wolves today, but they're slightly stockier, perhaps a little shorter. 
Um, we also had American lions, which are probably maybe a quarter bigger than the African lions today. It probably would have, its shoulder would probably be here on me, which is again, not something you want to meet on a dark night or any night really. Um, and then of course we have our saber-toothed cats, so Smilodon, which I love the name. Um, and so, um, and then of course we have bobcats, coyotes, weasels. And the nice thing about the tar pits is we actually have a really amazing sample of the carnivores in general because things would get trapped in the tar and they would come and try and scavenge on those and often get trapped. So we have wonderful records. So I do encourage you to go and see some of the skeletons here. And we're doing some of the radiocarbon dating of these things uh, in our uh, department. Okay, so that's sort of what our Ice Age animals would have looked like. And uh, I want to say something quickly, which is they all died out. They all died out maybe sort of 10, 11,000 years ago. And the fight about why they died out is, was it climate? Because it was so much warmer, all of a sudden we came out of the end of our ice age, and so it was warmer. Was it just that they weren't very well adapted? But the problem is most of these things had lasted through at least another of those full glacial and interglacial cycles. And so the question is, well, why did they die out this time around? Probably because we arrived. There seems to be a pretty good correlation in, say, Australia, um, in America, that a lot of this big characteristic sort of megafauna, it's called, these really big animals tended to, to die out not long after humans arrived. And so it could well be a combination of both, that climate uh, changing put some pressure on these things, uh, but also uh, we could well have a, a hand in it, and we probably do. And so I also wanted to say that apart from just having different animals, different vegetation, um, there were also different versions of us around at this time as well. Um, so in particular, hopefully most of you have heard of the Neanderthals that were around in uh, Europe. Um, and they lasted from maybe 200,000 years ago to maybe 28,000 years ago, so into the, the last ice age at least. Um, and there's people that fight over how long exactly they lasted. Um, who's heard of the Homo floresiensis? I can't say it. Has anyone heard of this one? One person? No one else? Oh, you're in for a treat. Okay, and then there's Homo sapiens, which are us, um, and we're sort of lasted from 200,000 years ago to today. But look at Homo floresiensis. It could have lasted up to 12,000 years, which is really remarkably recently, uh, given uh, what, sort of what changes we've seen. So it's uh, a fun thing. So how did we sort of move around? This is where ice comes back to, to sort of influence us again, because definitely uh, uh, sort of anatomically modern humans evolved in Africa maybe 200,000 years ago, and then spread out throughout the world. We're a, a hugely successful species, uh, if you'd like to look at it that way. Um, and so you can see that we spread out into the, the Middle East maybe 100,000 years, then down into Asia 70,000 years ago. And in particular, do you remember what our sea level was doing at this time? You can see that actually that spread of people down into places like Australia probably could happen because of the fact that we had this extra ice that meant that our sea level was so much lower. We have these extra what we call land bridges that help the dispersal of humans. And also, for all of the people uh, in this room, if you look up to the top, you can see that uh, people also came across from uh, Russia, across into Canada and Alaska, maybe 15,000 years ago. It's a bit controversial. But again, if we look at why that is, well, look, because we had a big giant land bridge again, because our sea level was lower. And so the fact that we had this sort of buildup of ice has really helped humans to spread around the world, which I think is so neat. And it's not something that people often think about, really. Okay. So, at least into that last ice age, we had these other uh, homo species around. And so the question is, was climate, again, responsible for their extinction, or was it perhaps us again um, spreading around the world, um, causing chaos? And so if we look at Neanderthals, these are a nice distinct species, and they were really much better adapted to the climate of the last ice age. They had a nice large nose for humidifying air. They were shorter and stockier, better at conserving body heat. 
Um, and we really can't necessarily pin down why exactly they went extinct. Um, the nice idea is that uh, that cooling um, and really dramatic fluctuation of climate to do with the, the thermohaline circulation shutting down, starting up, uh, might have put pressure on them. Um, they could have just been outcompeted by modern humans. If we had better technology, better communication, um, then we could just have sort of driven people out. Um, the, uh, one of the ideas was that there might have been interbreeding between the two and it might just have sort of merged the populations. The, the, the genetics behind that says that it maybe happened sort of 50,000 years ago. So Europeans maybe have sort of 1 to 4% of their DNA sort of shared with, with Neanderthals, but probably not more than that. But really, again, it's probably a combination of all of those yet again. Um, but I do love this story, and I got involved in this because my PhD work was on looking at some of the climate changes at the time that these guys went extinct. So it's a really interesting story, and uh, it's still being told in a lot of places. And then we have our Floresiensis. And these have been nicknamed the Hobbit because really they were very small. These guys, you can see they're sort of full size there compared to a normal uh, human, uh, homo sapiens rather. Um, they lasted probably from 95,000 years ago to maybe 12,000. This is a, a really recent discovery. They were discovered in 2003. And so there's a lot of fights still about exactly whether they're a completely new species or whether perhaps this particular island which they're found on, maybe they lost of some of the thyroid uh, sort of capacity or something like that. Um, it's a really interesting argument. And in this case, we really can't say that climate had anything to do with their extinction. What wiped these guys out was probably just a really nearby eruption. But they were at least around uh, during the last Ice Age too. So they're fun. You should look those up. OK. So I'm going quite quickly. But I also wanted to look more recently. So something slightly more relevant to civilization as we sort of think of it today and that is the Little Ice Age. So here's our temperature record um, compared to, say, the, the 1961 to 1990 average. So from 1000 AD to 2000. Okay? And that line there at zero represents the 1961 1990 average. And we have the Little Ice Age, which is basically that really cold period between maybe 1900 and sort of 1300. That's our Little Ice Age. You can see that temperatures were much cooler then. How much cooler were they? Wake everyone up again. OK, any last answers? Right, let's take a look. <laughs> you guys are messing with me again. I can never work it out. OK, so my scale. So on the left, you can see this is uh, a difference from the average. So zero represents that sort of that uh, average temperature from 1961 to 1990. So above that, zero line is warmer by 0.1, 2, 3, up to 0.5. Below that is our sort of cooler. Okay, and what we're looking at is the average. So not the full grey sort of uncertainty, but what that black line is doing. Okay, so roughly. How much cooler was it? Just look at that black line. Don't worry about the gray bars. OK, let's see if that's any better. That's better, thank you. Good, so it's 0 0.4. For everyone else that seems to be a little confused, what we're looking at is the difference between this straight line, which represents the average, and maybe sort of the cold down here. And really, it doesn't get much below minus sort of 0.4 cooler than that average. OK, so that's what we're looking at. So we're really not talking about a huge change in temperature, right? Because what are we predicted to be by the end of the century, potentially? How much warmer? Four-ish, maybe three, four-ish. So bear in mind that number, and then I'm going to show you what some of the changes were during our little ice age. OK, so first of all, we can find evidence for this in just the, the art and the paintings from the time. 
So often, well, especially if anyone reads Jane Austen, I know I do, um, then often it's always snowing, right? And, and they always show England and the snow in Charles Dickens and things. It's not artistic license. It probably was much colder and snowy at that time. Um, and you can also see this in paintings from around Europe at this time as well. It was often much snowier and icier. And we had things like uh, ice bears on the Thames. Um, so it was colder. And so what changes were seen? Well, we saw that sea ice moved a lot further south. So uh, for the people and the Vikings living on Iceland, um, they would document that it was difficult for their, their boats to get out at certain times. Uh, glaciers grew worldwide. There was a little village in Switzerland that got wiped out because the glacier advanced over the top of it. And there's not really a lot you can do to stop your glacier doing that. Um, we had global uh, temperatures that were much cooler in general. Um, uh, we also had things like so the, the Vikings that lived around Greenland, um, they couldn't cope anymore and so they definitely moved on. So the question is what could have caused this? But this is actually a really quite significant shift in our climate and it's nothing at this time to do with us necessarily because we haven't hit the industrial revolution, we're not releasing um, different greenhouse gases, so what could potentially have caused this? So do you remember our list? This is definitely a return to several weeks ago. It feels a very long time ago. So again, do you think there's any of my list here that I might be able to rule out? Does anyone want to give me a number of which one I can move out, rule out? Four. Four, yep, most likely. Any others? Two, definitely, in the last few hundred years, our, our continents have not been whizzing around the Earth. Yeah. Six. Six, absolutely. Six would be uh, one that we can rule out because it's really not changing. I mean, hundreds of time years, maybe a little bit, but we're not changing on big timescales. So what are we left with? We are left with number one. Number three, it'd be surprising if surface characteristics could have that big an effect. So we're left with one uh, and five. Okay, what might change the amount of aerosols in our atmosphere? Humans. Humans could, but probably not at that time. There were just many, many fewer of us. What else could do it? Volcanoes, volcanoes. And so this might give us a clue. So really, we're left with one and five. Okay, variations in solar output and aerosols. Feedback processes, it's, uh, it's possible that we might see changes in that thermohaline circulation, but it's a bit difficult to, to sort of get very far with that one. It's most likely it's one or five or a bit of a combination of both. So let's look at what our sunspots are doing. Do you remember we have our sunspot cycle every 11 years or so? And do you remember when we looked at this originally, we said that there is evidence of much longer term uh, uh, change. And in particular, if you look, early on, where we sort of first see our, our records where they're being collected by, I think, the Italians back in the 1600s, we can see a real minimum in terms of solar activity. So we're not seeing much solar activity there. And so it is quite possible that our temperatures may have been a bit cooler. It's difficult to explain exactly how such a small change in solar output could could drive such a big change in temperature, but there's definitely a, 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 a factor. And the other ones, the aerosols, we had quite uh, a succession of big uh, major eruptions between 1500 and the 1800s. And again, we can see evidence for this in the art of the time, because we all thought that, there, again, there was a bit of artistic license going on in the sunsets. And again, it probably wasn't. All of that volcanic ash floating around in the atmosphere created really beautiful sunsets at that time. So again, it does sort of fit in. <coughs> Um, and so it just could be that there was a high level of aerosols in the atmosphere and that could have blocked some of our incoming radiation, so it could also have cooled us down. So we do at least have some suggestions for what might have been the causes. Um, but can you think of, well, I already told you that, for example, the Vikings around Greenland had to move away or they starved and so their settlements collapsed. Can you think of any effects on agriculture that this might have had? Which one? So definitely after big eruptions, there was one in Iceland, then the, the acid and things didn't do agriculture any good. But in general, sort of colder temperatures, what do you think happens to... 
they, they don't grow as well. So definitely we sort of started to see some famines in, in Europe. What about what you can grow? That also shifts slightly. So we did have sort of vineyards in England uh, at parts uh, in times in the past, but they also have shut down at this time. Um, health. Obviously, if it's colder, then people don't do as well, especially if that's tied in with um, a lack of food and famine. If you then tie that into economics, remember, we were really an agricultural driven society at that time. The economics isn't so good. And all of these things lead to social unrest. Okay? And so there are some really interesting uh, sort of arguments about how this sort of time in terms of climate uh, may have led to sort of uh, uh, different sort of social changes as well, which is a really interesting idea. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Get to finish a bit early today, but I will see you on Wednesday for floods.